Then he commented that the Europeans seem to put international law up on a pedestal. Well, maybe there is a happy medium. Thanking the Federalist Society, and in particular the uh, parish chapter of the Federalist Society, and our uh, French guests for sharing this occasion with us. Uh, and I, I want to start by um, somewhat disagreeing with Francois. Um, I think that we do have some fundamental disagreements with um, our European friends. Uh, the, the term that you hear most often in discussions of the European Union is that it has pooled the sovereignty of the member states. And I want to get all of you to focus on that for a minute because I think that is a real window on what we're talking about. Pooling means we don't have it individually anymore, but we have it together. Some of us feel that we should lose some weight. Some of us are told that we should exercise more. We can get into a group and say, you do the weight loss, you, you do the diet, you do the exercise, and we'll pool our physical regimen. Uh, you be good, I won't be so good, and younger people um, will pool our virginity. There's some things that cannot be pooled. As soon as they are pooled, you're not talking about that thing anymore. It either belongs to a particular body or it has become meaningless. And indeed, the Europeans have pooled their sovereignty. Um, you have a court in uh, Luxembourg, which not only claims the authority to um, in, overrule statutes, passed by the parliaments, and to say this goes directly into your law, but claims the authority to override uh, national constitutions. If you have pooled your sovereignty to the extent that foreign judges can tell you which portions of your constitution are no longer valid, it seems to me that you are not sovereign in a way that Americans would recognize. And I believe that uh, the European Union, or at least the example of the European Union, does encourage people to think that we've entered a world in which sovereignty is a very secondary thing and actually a meaningless thing. Um, if you break down the strong sense of sovereignty that, yes, Jean Baudin and other Europeans uh, bequeathed to us, uh, then it becomes really confusing what exactly international law is about. Um, Textbooks published as recently as the 1950s used to record this very, very traditional definition. International law is the body of rules setting out the rights and duties of sovereign states in their mutual interactions. It was about the relations of sovereigns to each other. And increasingly, people talk about international law as if it is, um, to use that wonderful expression of Oliver Wendell Holmes, a brooding omnipresence in the sky or as he said in another context, about international law. It's a mystic overlaw. He, he meant to be um, sarcastic, but I believe that is a pretty accurate description of how people come to think of it. It's just something out there which covers us all sort of like climate, sort of like um, weather. So I, I want to just briefly set out three things that seem to me to be driving this. And when you think about each of them, you realize, yes, we, we are we are moving into a different mental universe, which is, I think, that we should be resisting. Um, so the first is human rights law. Everyone's in favor of human rights. I'm in favor of human rights. Everyone in America should be in favor of human rights. But if you think human rights are guaranteed by international law, what you're saying is there's this body of law which governs the relations between citizens and their own government. Uh, if you think it is universal, and everyone now says they're universal because after all they started with a universal declaration, then uh, this body of law applies equally to democracies and dictatorships. And indeed, it abstracts from the difference between democracies and dictatorships. All of them are, uh, everyone is bound by international human rights law. And so you can't let yourself be distracted by strategic conflicts between like the good guys and the bad guys in the world, or your friends and your enemies. Uh, there's human rights for everyone all the time. Uh, and if you're serious about this, which of course most people aren't, but if you are serious about this, how could there be international guarantees of human rights if every government were free to say, well, we signed and we committed, but we were just kidding, so we're not going to do it. The treaty, it seems, and the treaty law, the interpretations of the treaty law, should somehow take priority over mere 
national government policy, which is, after all, just about sovereignty and therefore not so important. Uh, human rights are supposed to be sacred and fundamental. So people start talking about human rights law. They use this phrase quasi-constitutional. What does that mean? It means it should have higher authority than you know, actual constitutions, which are merely national. Uh, it's something up there in the sky, which is above um, nations. Um, so that, that, that's one thing driving this. And if you take this seriously, then you start thinking nations and their governments and their claims of sovereignty are somehow suspect because it's at odds with this wonderful inspirational principle of international human rights. The second thing is um, multilateral organizations, uh, which are standing bodies now, standing as in standing armies. Um, no one worked for the Congress of Vienna, no one worked for the Congress of Berlin. Uh, the, the various national delegations brought people along, and you worked clearly for Britain, France, Germany, whatever delegation it was, Austria, Hungary. Um, ban Ki-moon works for, I don't know, the world, and there's 20,000 UN employees, and who do they work for? I don't know, humanity. Um, Pascal Lamy at the WTO, who does he work for? Well, not exactly humanity, but business or commerce or trade in the abstract. Uh, we begin to think that these entities are not just forums for governments to make agreements with each other, but that they are somehow entities in themselves. And if they are below governments, well then the governments will be kicking them around and abusing them and negating them, so somehow they should be above governments. And again, the EU is that. I mean, it claims that its law takes priority over national law. If it's true of the EU, shouldn't it be true of the Security Council, and if the Security Council, why not um, the Human Rights Council, or at least the uh, Human Rights Committee, which claims that it, in fact, is superior to the United States Senate, because it claims the authority to negate reservations in American ratifications of human rights treaties. That is perfectly logical. If you take seriously, this is a body which is out there to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, which is uphold a universal standard. And so on and so on through a lot of standing um, entities. Um, let me mention one last thing, which I think is, in a way, the most crucial. If you take seriously that the world is organized for collective security, then there's something a little bit suspect about nations defending themselves, or anyway, superfluous, and in fact, untrustworthy, because each nation would be self-regarding. Um, so then it seems perfectly plausible and logical that there should be international entities which tell nations you can do this, you can't do this, not even in self-defense. And uh, the idea that there should be some international authority to keep everyone in line, restrain everyone, is so attractive that people buy into this even when the treaties don't exactly um, support it. Before I sit down, I, I, I want to mention the news of the day, uh, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. Uh, the Obama administration has said um, they're going to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, in um, ordinary criminal court in New York. Uh, why are they doing that? Well, I don't even know why they're doing that, but they did read that uh, they've been in close consultation with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Why do we need their permission? Why do we need to satisfy them? What is that about? Uh, there's been dispute about um, the health care bill and whether uh, it will or will not cover abortions. If the Obama administration were in negotiations with the Vatican, to clear this, to make sure that this, this satisfied the Vatican, that we were not undermining the right to life as the Vatican understands it, I think there would be an outcry because people would say, that's a foreign body interfering, interfering in our affairs. Somehow the International Committee of the Red Cross, we think well, we need to negotiate with them because they're international. And uh, they would give us the, the imprimatur that we are acting in accord with uh, international law. This sounds more plausible if you take away the first premise of sovereignty, which is you rely on your own government for your self-defense, because other people aren't going to defend you. And if we move into a world in which we sort of think that, well, oh, there's an international order, there's international movements that they can defend us, then it seems that it's important for us to get credit for, you know, defending ourselves in the right way. Um, Stanley Baldwin said about the press <laughs> that um, they, um, saw power without responsibility, the harlot's prerogative. And I have read that uh, this was actually coined by Richard Kipling, and it's so quaint that I think we missed the point. He was talking about like, your, the, the king's mistress, who whispers in the ear of ministers, I think you should do this, I think you should do that, but is not accountable in a direct way like uh, actual members of parliament who have to get elected. Um, I think that's the ICRC, that's NGOs, 